Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me well? Uh, good morning to this uh, uh, panel um, devoted to uh, explaining different case studies of uh, projects on so solidarity. My name is Constanze Itzel. I have the huge responsibility to be director of the House of European History in Brussels that some of you might know. Uh, when I uh, saw the map outside of this room uh, where we are asked where we come from, uh, I didn't know what to put because we could put the origins of my family from Prague or from Silesia. We could put where I was raised in Bavaria or my, home, my current hometown, which is Brussels. Uh, so um, I, uh, I, this is just to frame this panel um, because some of my uh, panelists also share this diverse origin in their biography, and we will also try to have a European and transnational approach in this panel. This morning, we've heard a lot about the political use of uh, memory, uh, the political use of memory that uh, can be uh, used not only to reconcile, but also to divide and to make nationalistic or imperialistic claims. Um, and now I would say that we, uh, on this background of, of describing this political use of memory, we are, we are moving now uh, to the civil society movements and to different, um, to panelists from different uh, disciplines who are uh, trying to build solidarity by different means. And uh, this panel has several challenges. Uh, the most practical of which I would say that those of you who don't have Spanish biorhythm might get hungry during the time of this panel. I hope that you will stick uh, with us until 1.30. Uh, the more uh, practical challenge in the moderation is that we have five panelists and from very diverse backgrounds and from very diverse disciplines. So very typical for a European uh, panel, for a European uh, topic. Um, to, in order to bridge a little bit uh, the, the diversity that we are dealing with, um, I've thought about how to make it, um, uh, how to create some links between uh, the, the topics we are going to speak about. And first, I'd like to mention once more, uh, well, the theme of the panel, solidarity. Yesterday and this morning, we've heard many different definitions of this word. A solidarity with a big S and a small S, we were told this morning, solidarity as a foundation, the foundation that hosts us here, and thank you very much for this. Solidarity as a very important historical movement uh, and uh, many different meanings of the word uh, in different languages that are represented here in the room. But one thing that I would like to pick up uh, on uh, from yesterday is the, the, uh, the definition um, of Rafael Rogulski, who told us that ethnologically speaking, etymologically speaking, sorry, false friend, uh, the, the word can come from bond, uh, can mean a bond. And so, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the two networks that host us here, because uh, bringing these two networks, Eurom and ENRS, together here is already, does already mean weaving new bonds. And I will try to do my best also to try and weave some bonds between the panelists here, because they are really diverse in origin, and hopefully also between the panelists and the audience. So um, in terms of how we will proceed, uh, it's a bit like the panel this morning, uh, five minute presentations by all the projects uh, that are represented here. Uh, then I have some follow up questions and then uh, we will open uh, the discussion with the audience. And uh, for the order of appearance, uh, I think this morning it was alphabetical. This time I will ask you to figure, to imagine a map of Europe and we will go, we will move from east to west uh, although, as I said, most projects have a very transnational and European uh, way of looking at things and also uh, cross-border ways of uh, representing solidarity. So, um, we will embark on a journey from Ukraine with Bogdana, who you see in the middle. I will introduce the panelists later a bit more specifically. To Poland, Ukraine with Maciej, then up to Finland with Erki. Uh, to Spain with some Romanian origins with Luisa, and Luisa will speak in Spanish, so have your headphones ready if you need them. And finally to Strasbourg with a very pan-European outlook with Finn. And all projects we will discover have a cross-border, transnational or even pan-European perspective, and so I hope that we can complement the paradigms of this morning's panel, because this morning's panel, I don't know if you realized, they were very much made up of the case of Spain and in the case of Romania and in the case of Hungary, etc., which is normal because history is perceived like this. But today here we will try to 
to look a bit more into the, the cross-border interactions and transnational uh, links um, of uh, creating solidarity and uh, cooperation. Uh, this order of appearance also means that we will move through different academic disciplines uh, or uh, different ways and means of creating solidarity. We will start with projects uh, based on literature and literature translation. Then we will discover the important work historians are doing for reconciliation. And finally, also humanitarian aid and education um, and history teaching and, and some other means like exhibitions. So I would like to embark you now on this journey through different uh, disciplines, different, um, different ways. And the two questions I will put to the panelists are very simple. The what and the how. What are you doing? What does solidarity mean for you? And how, by which means do you think can solidarity be built? And how can we learn from you? What works, what doesn't work? Uh, so how do, you, how do your projects foster cooperation, solidarity, mutual understanding, and also hopefully reconciliation. So I will start with Bogdana. Bogdana, who is in the center of, your, of the table. Bogdana Brilanska is a, is a cultural manager, and she has worked for Lviv City Council's creative programs uh, after graduating in 2009 with an MA from the Ivan Franco National University of Lviv. She co-authored uh, this city's application for the title of UNESCO City of Literature, as well as the city's cultural strategy up until 2025. And obviously, um, she operates in a very uh, tense context now, in a very difficult context that we are curious to hear about, where solidarity suddenly takes on a very different and very serious meaning. So, Bogdana, I would like to ask you to introduce your projects for five minutes, please. Uh, I just wanted to ask first, is there possible to show the PDF that I uh, sent, or no? I'm to be prepared. <laughs> I will start just to say for people who don't know what is the UNESCO City of Literature title. It's a title that connects p uh, cities to the network of the cities of literature. Uh, now we have almost 42 cities all over the world. And uh, I want to start with that to explain that from the beginning we uh, started to uh, work in the meaning of the network in general. To, uh, we the city of literatures are the network that uh, is working with the literature, with the freedom of speech, and uh, also with the translation. Uh, for the cities of literature, when the war started in Ukraine, it was a bit uh, also difficult to talk about this because uh, to our network there are two, like there is Lviv in this uh, network at the same year. There was a city from Russia, Ulyanovsk, who got the title also, uh, the city of literature. But uh, when the war started, uh, there was a lot of communication. How do we communicate and what do we do uh, in the network and how we explain and how we show the solidarity in this network. Uh, in general, it's very hard for, to work in culture now in Ukraine, as you can imagine. Uh, you are not only doing the culture projects, you need to think what these culture projects are talking about the war in Ukraine and what they are talking about the Ukrainian history in the meaning uh, of what is happening now. And every um, journey that I am taking from the beginning of the war is a journey from home to somewhere where I am not safe in the meaning of the language, in the meaning of the stories that I should tell, and the meaning of the reaction that I will get from these stories. Uh, last year, when our office started to work on the projects uh, and started to speak about what is happening in Ukraine, uh, it was hard for, uh, for us to find the language and the stories that we need to tell. And we started the first thing that we did, we did the video with the um, English explanation of the history of li the literature of Ukrainian literature in Ukraine. How we lost a lot of poets during the whole time that we were uh, colonized by the Russian Imperium, and how we lost uh, our language a few times, and how we are uh, regaining it for the last 30 years that uh, we are independent state. And we were talking about the people, 
about their remembrance, about the famous Ukrainian poets, for us famous, maybe you will not know these names, but it was about Taras Shevchenko, he is the most famous one, it was about Lysa Ukrainka, and it was about Vasil Stus. All these three poets were uh, living in the times when they, there was no um, Ukraine in the meaning of the uh, independent state. But they were Ukrainians and they were speaking Ukrainian language and they were writing about the Ukraine as an independent state. And uh, uh, Taras Shevchenko, he was bought out from Kripatstvo. It's the form of the slavery that was in the Ukrainian uh, territory uh, in led by the Russian Imperium. Uh, Lesa Ukrainka, she was the woman and she was the Ukrainian author at the same time. And she was the beginner of the feministic movement in Ukraine. And Vasil Stus, he was a Ukrainian poet at the beginning of the 60s in Ukraine when there was a totalitarian regime in Ukraine made by the USSR, uh, USSR, but you need to understand that at that time you cannot speak Ukrainian and be published in Ukrainian. It could be only published in Russian language. So for us now it's very important so we will tell about these stories. And in the end, uh, Vasil Stus died in prison because he was fighting in the meaning as a, he was a dissident and he was uh, publishing poems that were not very convenient for that uh, government at that time. Why I am speaking about him? Because uh, um, the project that I will be talking about started with a quote from his poem. Uh, and uh, this quote was... Uh, was very, is very popular in Ukraine because one of the soldiers that was fighting at the, at the front line, uh, uh, he read it on the video uh, while he was bombed. He, what do you do when you are under the shilling? And he was reading the poetry of Vasil Stus about the dignity, about the, uh, that you need to stand your ground to be and to be in this place and to do what you are doing, to protect what you are protecting. And this poetry is about this. And this was the, qu uh, the quote that we choose and we wrote about the idea of the project to our partners in, uh, partners in Vilnius, Lithuania, and uh, they recall for us. We decided to do the project uh, connected to the young uh, writers or emerging writers in Ukraine and in Lithuania. The idea was very simple. We did this program before the war, but it, the theme, as you can understand, changed, and we started to work with uh, how do you go to the freedom? What is your way to the freedom? How do you find your ground in the times when everything is crashing all over Ukraine? And not only in Ukraine, because the idea was to also talk to Lithuanian authors, because Lithuania is also now in the, on the border with this, uh, with all of this, what is happens, and they have their own history about this uh, singing revo revolution in uh, in Lithuania, when uh, the Soviet Union army d killed people, and they were trying to take their freedom. So we have this connection, and we found the support uh, from their side in the meaning of money, because as you can imagine, in Ukraine now we don't have a lot of money for uh, culture. Uh, because we need to still stand our ground in this war. And uh, we started to collect the uh, novels, short novels from all over Ukraine and from all over uh, Lithuania about this time. We just, about your experience, how to find the freedom. And it was very interesting for us. We got the novels from all over Ukraine, like from the cities that were under the shilling at that moment and uh, also from the people who moved because of the war who were now not in Ukraine because the war started and this uh, very strange like the story that was built during from from this one point like from the point of war and from the point of going uh, from the war to another country it, will, it showed us a very similar and understandable uh, position of hurt that these people, all, all of us, the Ukrainians now, are the people who are hurting from what is happening in very different ways. And I want to recall the um, question that was 
on the previous panel about this Syrian who are also running. And when I am talking about this war and when we are talking about this war, we need to understand that it's not conflict because, be, between Ukrainians and Russians. It's another aggression against the people that are done by the Russian country. And this is what we need to understand. The Georgian people, the Lithuanian people, we are, solidar so we are in the solidarity because of this hurt, because of this pain that was done to us. Uh, and uh, when we presented the, uh, this project to our colleagues in the cities of literature uh, in Australia, they decided to do the translation into English because we did the translation from Lithuanian to Ukrainian, from Ukrainian to Lithuanian. All the texts are translated. And now they will be also published in English. Um, and I think that we will do this year also another project, but with poetry, because we work with the literature as a method of remembrance and uh, the method of gathering all this expression. Because I think, I know history is very important, but as a person who works with literature, I should say that uh, sometimes um, the novel which was written or the poetry which was written at the moment of the tragedy it says you more than all the stories you can hear from that moment. Excuse me, Bogdana? Yes, I I'm finishing, I'm finishing. So thank you, and uh, that was like very brief presentation. The last, I think it's not very good visible, but this is the, the, our first page. And this red line that you see, we decided to show it like the red line that you cannot cross or cannot stand back because you need to stand your ground to find your freedom. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Bogdana. And sorry for being so brutal with the time. It's just in the interest of uh, the, the following speakers. Uh, we will stay in the field of, uh, of literature and translation because also Maciej Piotrowski has told us in the preparatory meeting that uh, for him that uh, the reading of each other's literature is a, is a key factor. So um, Maciej is a historian and studies scholar and animator of cultural life in the Polish-Ukrainian borderland. Uh, he has worked on the exhibition of the Holodomor Museum in Kiev and he, he translates Euro Ukrainian literature uh, such as the novel now you help me to pronounce the Ukrainian name. I will say it in English, The Yellow Prince. Um, and uh, he has collaborated with the Creators Foundation, the College of Eastern Europe, and the Folkovsky uh, Association. So, um, Maciej, uh, can you confirm what was said before, that contemporary literature is a, a means of expression of hurt or of uh, what contemporaries live through? And, uh, and yeah, please speak about your work of translating it into different languages. Thank you. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, so, uh, truly I am working with uh, literature, but also uh, with exhibition in Nizio Design International, uh, exhibition, museums, literary, cultural projects, all it's about narration, about something which uh, has to be told to people and translate to another uh, people, to another culture. Uh, however, maybe I will start uh, uh, with my personal story, because uh, it, uh, uh, it's something about searching of uh, solidarity, of mutual understanding. Because uh, I myself, I was born on Polish-Ukrainian borderland, uh, on uh, Zamojszczyzna region in Poland, and it was something in 20th century which was called by Timothy Snyder as a bloodlands, places of genocides, of ethnic cleansing, but for me, in the, my young years, it was just my homeland, uh, the place where I was uh, rising, uh, uh, doing some first projects. But uh, once I uh, went by bus across the border uh, to Lviv, the beautiful city uh, where Bogdana, uh, uh, Bogdana is uh, working, and I discovered this vivid place real uh, city with uh, modern cultural life, not just historical buildings, cemeteries, but uh, real modern life. And I start to cooperate with uh, artists, with musicians uh, uh, from Lviv, and started to bringing them to Poland. Uh, 
uh, and uh, different events, uh, festivals, uh, and starting to connecting uh, to groups. Uh, and we established, while I was studying uh, on Lviv University, established uh, with brothers and friends uh, association of borderland culture uh, and starting to animate this life on borderland. Uh, maybe what is important here that uh, that was uh, funded in the village which, which was wiped out by Polish-Ukrainian conflict. However, we want to make this place, Gorajec, uh, little village in Poland, from recreate from the symbol of tragic past of Polish-Ukrainian history to a site of reconciliation of, uh, uh, of our nations by doing creative work. Mm. Maybe I, I will jump in time a little bit and talk also about uh, the hugest challenge of mine, because after these creative cultural projects, uh, I moved to Warsaw and start cooperation with Nizio Design International and uh, Holodomor Museum uh, in Kiev, which is building now. Uh, I'm working uh, three, four years uh, on this project, and I think it's uh, really important, not only because of that uh, it is uh, very huge uh, and important uh, uh, from uh, artistical and architectural po point of view, and because of that, it will be the first uh, this scale uh, modern museum on uh, Ukraine. Uh, but also because of, of this, my personal story, because of that historical burdens of Polish-Ukrainian history. Uh, and um, by that, by this project, we can show that Polish and Ukrainians can do together very huge, great historical project. Um, and uh, maybe I will not focus on, on this, because uh, tomorrow we will be uh, have a chance to, uh, um, to listen to the leader of the project, Miroslav Nisho, and he will talk more about this, this great uh, initiative. But I will just say about my role uh, as a historian, because uh, uh, I am in this project a bridge between the team of curators from Kyiv and team of designers from Poland in this, uh, this national, uh, transnational, international consortium. Uh, and I'm helping, trying to help them to understand each other, translating not only the words, uh, but also the, some context, some, uh, some historical background, and trying to uh, also not to impose some uh, some solutions from Poland to Ukraine, but uh, trying to debate, to discuss about it. Mm. But yes, maybe, maybe more about it uh, later. Uh, so in connection also to tell about literature, uh, um, as, uh, as it was said, uh, I am a translator of literature, a book about Holodomor, uh, Vasyl Barka, Yellow Prince, uh, first after 60 years uh, after publishing it, it is published in Polish, Poland now. Uh, and what is uh, maybe important here, uh, I also tried to animate this um, environment uh, of, of translators in Central Europe and try to uh, make some platform of cooperation of translators. Uh, we create with friends in 2018 a project called uh, Rostaje Crossroads, uh, and is uh, gathering people from Latvia to Serbia, from Poland to Ukraine. Um, and it wasn't just another grant project, uh, just not another seminar, but this platform when we making friends, uh, making strong relations with each other, trying to. Uh, communicate, help, promote each other, uh, but maybe also later about, about this strengthening the professional communication and standards. However, uh, in this our world of uh, cultural animators, translators, exhibition uh, uh, and museology uh, world, uh, this world was changed uh, by uh, February uh, 24, uh, open Russian aggression against Ukraine, against our neighbor, and it turned most of this project upside down. 
But I think the, uh, due to these networks which was created, uh, we maintain some balance. And for example, in Nisha Design, we were trying by, by our NGOs, Nisha Foundation, we are trying to firstly support uh, Ukrainian migrants coming to Warsaw uh, and making a project for young artists who came, became uh, architectural artists who can be designers uh, of uh, such product, project as Holodomor Museum in future. Uh, and also we maintain uh, contact with Holodomor Museum team and trying to, uh, to work together uh, uh, to make our project implementable in the future, because of course now due to war, uh, it is really hard to work on such a, such a team, but it's, it is very crucial for, uh, for uh, our nations. Uh, also in other uh, my activities, like in uh, this translators group, Rostaya, we established a scholarship for uh, Ukrainian best reporters uh, and due to, uh, by our uh, networks in media, in uh, translators, uh, we were translating the, their uh, reports from Ukraine and publishing it in the uh, best media of Central Europe in, uh, I suppose now, seven or eight languages and uh, giving the floor to the Ukrainians. And in, they can speak in their voices translated by uh, um, translators from Central Europe. So from all these projects to tell about solidarity, I can say that for solidarity you need mutual understanding. And uh, translator and cultural animation uh, is, I think, important in this project, in this process, because uh, uh, mm, we, we can help people to communicate, to understand these narratives which is produ uh, produced by uh, by, uh, by culture and translate it to another world of, uh, uh, of another culture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maciej. Uh, you, you said that uh, for solidar solidarity we need to understand each other and translation for you is a, is a means translation of narratives. Now if we stay in this image, we will now look at the case of how historical narratives can be confronted with each other and brought into contact, uh, context, uh, with, uh, contact with each other, um, and how a better understanding of each other's historical narrative can, uh, can lead to mutual understanding, and that is what uh, Erki Tuyo Moya is working um, on, and because he is the founding chairman of Historians Without Borders in Finland, uh, he has been working on that since 2015, uh, and he has a PhD in social sciences, um, a master in economics and business administration, and he's teaching political history at the University of Helsinki. And he has also a, a very impressive political career behind him. So Erki, uh, could you speak a little bit about how history, um, how uh, reconciling or um, uh, historical narratives uh, works, and, and also probably the current challenges that you, that you face in the current situation? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, coming from Finland, I think that we do ha have uh, some knowledge and experience of uh, uh, both uh, resistance and solidarity. And uh, today, of course, there are lots of references to our experiences during the Winter War 1939. And we are very, this is fine with us, as long as people do not refer to the continuation in 1941 when we joined the Nazi attack against uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, but I would also like to re remind you of 1918, because 1918 we had a bloody civil war in Finland with uh, tens of thousands of uh, uh, people killed. Uh, but luckily, uh, at the end of the war, we avoided both a fascist and a communist dictatorship. But the uh, civil war left a very bitter legacy in the country, uh, and uh, it was only really overcome of course, by our joining together uh, against the aggressor in 1939, but uh, actually it took about 100 years before we could share the memories of this civil war uh, with all the parties acting together and their descendants uh, doing this together. And this brings me to the role of uh, memory in uh, history. 
because uh, as historians who write history and, and use historical sources know, memory is always the most unreliable part of the sources you use. It is uh, subjective and it is also very selective. Uh, but it is necessary to use them. But I think we should work to get uh, memories into shared memories of also of the most difficult parts of our uh, history. And this is what Historians Without Borders is about. Uh, it was based on the uh, countless occasions that I, both as foreign minister uh, in my country and as a historian, had encountered how history kept being used and misused, abused, uh, to foster conflicts and prevent conflict resolution in uh, various parts of the world. And even very ancient history, think about 1385, Kosovo Polya um, in the Balkans, uh, is still very much alive and being used uh, uh, to prevent uh, reconciliation and, and conflict prevention. So uh, we asked ourselves, what could and should historians do to prevent this kind of misuse of history? Because mostly it is not historians themselves. There are exceptions, unfortunately, but it is mostly the media and politicians who uh, primarily misuse and abuse history for their own ends. And we wanted to bring historians across borders together to counter this misuse and abuse of history. So we founded the uh, Historians Without Borders as a Finnish NGO in 2015, but it also acts as the secretariat for the International Network of Historians Without Borders, which we established uh, at the end of our international conference um, on the use and abuse of uh, history in uh, 2016. Yes, uh, and according to the declaration which was adopted at the conference, our aim is to deepen general and comprehensive knowledge and understanding of history, promote uh, uh, open and free access to historical materials and archives, encourage interactive dialogue between different views and interpretations of history to assist in the process of uh, mutual understanding and support efforts to identify the abuse of history in fostering and sustaining conflicts, help defuse conflicts uh, and contribute to conflict resolution processes, and to promote the teaching of history in the spirit of uh, this declaration, and in also incorporating an understanding of the role of women and gender perspectives in efforts to build peace and resolve conflicts. So we are not primarily uh, seeking to take sides in any conflicts about different interpretations uh, of history. Uh, rather, uh, we have seen our role as a facilitator, bringing together opposing parties uh, in uh, conflicts uh, concerning history with the aim of removing uh, this use uh, in the conflict. So it's more than resistance, it's about reconciliation uh, whenever possible. And thus, at our 2016 conference in Helsinki, we had workshops uh, uh, bringing together historians from uh, Interalia, Israel and Palestine, Turkey and Armenia, Finland and Russia, and historians from former colonies and colonial powers. And we have also sought to spread knowledge and uh, of an interest in truth and reconciliation uh, commissions, uh, of which there are both good and uh, less good examples uh, from different parts uh, of the world. And concretely, we have been able to promote the establishment of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission based on an agreement between the government of Finland and the Sami parliament on the history and treatment of the indigenous Sami people uh, in Finland. Other items we have addressed is the role of Belarus in Europe at the seminar between Nordic and uh, Belarusian historians in 2020, when it was still possible to confer with independent uh, Belarusian colleagues. We have also arranged two meetings of historians uh, from Ukraine and Russia in Finland. Uh, but this was before the war, obviously, and obviously as long as the war continues, now, this kind of dialogue is impossible, but historians from both sides have indicated their interest in continuing this dialogue 
when it again becomes possible. With the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, the use of history as a justification um, for war and as part of enemy images um, and uh, narratives um, uh, uh, is a European reality, and Putin justifies uh, her, his actions with symbols and narratives anchored in history, as well as demonizing Ukrainians with strongly loaded accusations. Uh, Ukraine and Western countries that support uh, this also made make use of historical concepts, images and, of enemies and symbolism. And on this theme, we arranged a panel discussion in Berlin last December with the participation of Russian historians living today in diaspora because of the conditions in Russia. And thus we are also seeking to bring together uh, his Russian historians um, uh, in, uh, living in the diaspora today uh, to support their work in preparing for a post-Putin Russia. Putin will not last forever. And with Putin there is no scope for historical dialogue. But, uh, we need to uh, also incorporate the work of Russian historians in this, because not all Russian historians are Putinist. And I have had the occasion twice to uh, give a presentation of Historians Without Borders at the Academy of Sciences in Moscow, when it was still possible. Uh, and uh, I was impressed by uh, the professionalism and independence, independence of Russian historians. But since then, of course, conditions have changed, and many of these people are now in living in diaspora. But bringing them together and supporting them uh, to get pro start a process of Vergangenheitsbewältigung, also in Russia, is, I think, uh, a very important uh, uh, contribution for us to show our solidarity in action, because uh, uh, an open and honest uh, dialogue with your former adversaries is a necessity for keeping the peace uh, in the future and removing the use of history in conflicts. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, also for preventing me to cut you. It's heartbreaking to cut so interesting. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and complex uh, presentations. Um, but we have two speakers who, who should uh, also get uh, their, their scene. So we now move to Luisa Jordake Castilla, who, uh, as I already said, is a little bit a bridge between um, Romania and Spain because she has lived in both and she's currently a lecturer and professor at the Department of Contemporary History at uh, the university, uh, at the National University of Distance Education. She has a PhD in political science and she told me before the panel that her main research interest is in humanitarian aid, so a very practical and very necessary, uh, especially in current times, uh, form of solidarity. Uh, so Luisa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Constance. Thank you very much for this invitation to the organizers and also to our guests, the University of Barcelona, Eurom, and Fundación Solidaridad. Thank you also for this opportunity to present our projects to sh and sh to share our work. I will switch to Spanish. So I'm going to start my talk with a sentence by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, British Minister Edward Gray, August 1914, when he was observing how the lamps in the streets of London were being lighted up. Uh, lights are being turned down all over Europe. Maybe we won't see them again in our lives. This sentence summarizes the beginning of a critical period in the history of Europe. As we know, it was a period of total war with an escalate of violence, with the confrontation of uh, concentrationary systems, uh, internment camps, concentration camps, forced labor, uh, killings of civil citizens, another sequela which affected the civil population, which was forced to be displaced, exilium, hunger, deportation, annihilation for political reasons, national international and a context of economic crisis and search of uh, Soviet communism and also the search of fascism in different countries of Europe. However, in the darkness of uh, Europe since 1914, some lights were light up, the ones of solidarity, of humanitarian aid, humanitarianism, voluntarism, and the culture uh, of peace. And these subjects 
contribute with two projects by uh, an international team. First of all, the Unicred project that has ended, and now the Remnant Child project, a project that we just started with an important network of members, and as the previous project Migrate is centered, among other aspects, in the importance of humanitarian aid and also solidarity, especially during the first half of the 20th century, meaning the first two world wars and the Spanish Civil War. We all know that solidarity is an idea, it's a concept, it's a principle, practice and action, and through the activities of Migrate and other projects, we show that this solidarity was the alma mater of the fight for the survival and also the combat against the dehumanization caused by wars and weapons. Both conflicts and also the Spanish Civil War raise borders between combatants and non-combatants, between the army and civil population, becoming the scenario of atrocities, atrocities committed on defenseless and innocent people. In this sense, with our projects and our activities, we showed that the humanitarian aid deployed at that time was the maximum expression of solidarity by taking care of civil population, especially the most vulnerable one, children, women, pregnant women and the elderly, helping the children, giving aid to the refugees, taking care of the sick, feeding the population, distributing humanitarian and moral help were humanitarian actions of solidarity in the European countries, actions developed by volunteers and with the help of many organizations, humanitarian organizations, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the Save the Children, Union International, the Secours Enfants, uh, British, American committees, etc. Also, with our projects through Remnant Child and Migrate, we proved that this humanitarian task in this humanitarian task, the fundamental role was played by women, forebringers of humanistic values, protectors of childhood, promoters of peace, defending rights and freedoms, and protecting lives. With this, we also want to say that we should not forget that wars were fought also by women with their efforts in the variety of tasks they carry out at different fronts. And unfortunately, getting to know history and its teaching of solidarity has not avoided new humanitarian crises, new waves of refugees, new conflicts, war conflicts, and many other violations of international humanitarian law. Although there is a lot of knowledge and promotion in protection of civil societies, events in different parts of the world nowadays, in Ukraine, but in the recent past, for example, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Rwanda, Bosnia, etc., proved that civilians continue to be the objectives and targets and main victims of war violence. And this is why, from migration, and remnant child, we want to make an appeal to the idea that the construction of peace and the consolidation of the culture of peace and also solidarity, it's a permanent task and mutual teaching among generations. Our projects attempt to improve the knowledge about this recent past, to make visible not only the negative aspects of the conflicts, but also to highlight other aspects such as solidarity and humanitarian aid. And we do it through exhibitions, international conferences, workshops, travel seminars, actions, local and national actions with the aim of preserving this past and above all to recover the collective, individual and individual experiences of people. Let me conclude my intervention the same way I started with a quote, but this time from Maria Zambrano, philosopher, a quote that you find in our catalog of exhibitions. May peace, and peace is not only the absence of war, but it's much more and beyond its uh, lifestyle 
it's a way of inhabiting the planet. And with these projects, the whole of our team want to contribute with a sudden uh, grain to this noble desire of peace and solidarity for the new generations of today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Luisa. By, by mentioning the teaching of history, you gave me a nice transition to our uh, speaker who uh, is uh, contributing to observing how history is being taught. And as we spoke about uh, state actors and, and history, uh, um, uh, well, the, the construction of historical narratives and the teaching of them, of course, schools are uh, one of the uh, outlets, if I may say so, of how governments uh, teach history and, and has been also over the past. Uh, so it's very interesting uh, to, to uh, analyze how history is being taught in different countries, and this is what uh, our last speaker, Finn Morton Hackard, works on, because he's project officer at the Observatory on History Teaching in Europe of the Council of Europe. But he also has, he's also working on the HistoLab, a Transnational History Education and Cooperation Laboratory, um, and he uh, completed a master's degree in Southeast European Studies at the University of Graz and the University College London. Uh, so I hand over to you, and uh, then we will um, go to the um, audience for some questions. All right, thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. Indeed, I'm representing here today mainly the Observatory on History Teaching in Europe, which is in a large partial agreement of the Council of Europe. And perhaps to understand the, the importance of history teaching and, uh, and our initiative in the context of solidarity and mutual understanding, it is worth to contextualize it very shortly in the Council of Europe and in the um, activities of the Council of Europe in the field of history teaching. So history teaching has, from the very beginning of the organization after the Second World War, has been recognized as a very important feature and element of um, building and preserving peace in Europe and to prevent these catastrophes of the Holocaust and Second World War uh, from happening again on the continent. Mm. In this way, there was a lot of intergovernmental uh, corporations focusing on textbook revisions, on um, recommendations how to teach the European dimension history teaching, and teaching multiple perspectives in the, in the classrooms to exactly with this goal to, to promote a mutual understanding between the uh, people in, in, in Europe. And um, the Observatory on History Teaching in Europe is quite a new um, initiative as it was established in 2020 and it complements the work of the Council of Europe in this field by looking at how history is actually taught in its member states. So um, we do this via actually several activities. So we have the reporting side of, of the activity, so we uh, generally, um, yeah, maybe it's better to first contextualize who is actually part of the, of the observatory. So the Council of Europe is uh, the organization with the 46 member states of uh, Europe and uh, inside this, it's a partial agreement. As I said, I don't know how I can now change the... Um, yeah, there it is, I think. Thank you. So um, inside the Council of Europe, the observatory is a partial agreement with 16 member states. Here you can see the map and two observer states. and. Um, so actually, our, um, we, what we do is we have the vision uh, to, to um, in line with what I just said about the Council of Europe, to actually um, foster mutual understanding and democratic culture through teaching history. And um, so what we are doing is we um, try, we do this by the issuing and creating of two types of reports. We have the general report on the state of history teaching in Europe, which will be the first one uh, to be released this year, where we look into exactly, uh, for example, the, um, the, the, um, how, what, what place does history have in the, in the educational system of the member states, uh, meaning uh, is it a standalone subject, is it integrated with other subjects, then uh, to see how the curricula are written, are they uh, written by uh, the government alone or in consultation with uh, civil society organizations, what are the, the preconditions of teachers to uh, fulfill, to be uh, allowed to study history basically, and also uh, to see how actually history uh, is uh, taught. Uh, in practice, is the European dimension um, recognized there as um, well? Uh, marginalized groups, the history of marginalized groups, are they um, implemented there? And are multiple um, 
yeah, perspectives integrated in the teaching, or is it rather a telling of a national narrative uh, in the history classroom? So um, besides uh, the, the regular report, we also have the thematic reports, which is a good chance to look into how the history is taught in regard to a special, a specific topic more in detail. So the first one was on the teaching of pandemics and natural disasters. And uh, the second one will be, uh, that was issued last year, and the second one, which is expected in 2024, is how uh, social and uh, no, which economic crises are taught in the history classes. And these reports, what makes them uh, valuable is actually to, to have, a, have a basis to see how history is taught, which can actually, as a basis, as a factual basis, enable to discuss the ways history is taught with a view to, to promoting uh, these values of the Council of Europe and then the that the member states have uh, subscribed to. Um, so we do this with a, with a variety of methods. So we have, the, um, we, we have the information from the governments, of course, uh, from the ministries on how they organize the history teaching. But of course, we cannot solely rely on the state information in those reports. So we cooperate with uh, teacher organizations and we had a, 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 a quite a huge teacher's questionnaire and we managed to get over 6,000 responses uh, from teachers from the uh, um, observatories member states to contrast this information from the governments and to complement it so that we have a, have a really um, more coherent um, and, and complex picture of the history teaching in, in, in the member states. Um, so then besides this, um, which is the, the part of the observatory uh, reporting, we have a joint project with the European Commission, which does not only, um, of course, then um, apply to the 16 member states who are part of the observatory, but to all the countries of the European Union and all the countries of the Council of Europe members uh, of the Council of Europe. So what we do here, we always say, well, the observatory is looking how in, uh, into how history is actually taught at the present moment. With the with the joint project, we are looking into how history could be taught in the future. So. Um, we had a lot of um, initiatives in this regard. So we, we formed, we created this digital platform of the of the Histolab joint project, where we actually uh, I don't know if you could if we can click we I linked the, the portal there in the uh, where we actually try to build a database um, of of organizations and experts in the field of history education in Europe and worldwide, um, because. Our partners and also the, the colleague from the from the Serve National Point uh, reported to me today in a in a in a, in a conversation that often um, we have uh, difficulties that people do not know what actually initiatives and organizations exist in the field of history education. So the aim is to bring them together. If you could click on the His Connect button, there you could see the. Um, can I do it myself? No. Okay. Uh, the, the His Connect button there at the very top. Exactly. So here you will see a, a database that you can filter to find project partners and organizations. And of course, this will be also a call for you to, to register yourself and your organizations and initiatives at the, at the platform in order to, to help building this database. It is very new. It was released uh, around two days ago, so it's growing and we get new membership applications uh, on everyday basis. And it will also serve as a, can we go back to the presentation? Uh, thank you. As a as a um, forum where um, projects can be presented, call for corporations, and uh, events can be uh, promoted and shared with the with the actually wide audience. For example, here you can see. I don't know how I can make the video play. Probably here, not at all. Um, it's just embedded. There's a video embedded on the slide. Um, it's perhaps if you just click on it, it should play. So. On the PowerPoint slide, this is the browser, I think, I believe. Um, you, you have to go on PowerPoint first. It doesn't work. Well, however, the idea is uh, that, that we build this database with a calendar of events where the organizations who registers can promote their events, enter them. So we have actually like a, a point where uh, history educators and people from the field can learn about the initiatives, events, new publications, and projects that are out there in the field and to connect uh, with each other. This we comp complement with, is, is, the, is the laptop um, frozen? Oh. 
Okay. Um, yeah, and besides this, we also have a resource hub where we actually bring together the massive amount of resources produced by uh, projects uh, in the field, which are very difficult to navigate, um, which, which promote a European dimension in history teaching and the multiple perspectives in teaching by uh, making, um, by not really incorporating them in the platform, but to provide a tool through which people, educators, can uh, see the areas of interest that they're interested in and find the projects and the resources that exist and uh, be redirected to their pages and to their resources uh, to make them, yeah, well, more navigable on the wide um, range of the internet. Well, and this is uh, complemented with some other actions like the History Lab Fellowship I, I presented yesterday or the European Innovation Days on History Education. And um, yeah, this is uh, what we mainly do in the Observatory and in the Council of Europe in the field of history education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Finn. Um, I'm trying, I will try now briefly to summarize what I've heard, but on a, in a very broad lines to connect what uh, you, you've all been saying. And uh, I will add one question from my side that came up, but, uh, but immediately open the floor to, to your questions, because then perhaps the speakers can take some of the questions at once. Otherwise, if we have another round, you won't get the floor. So um, my... Um, my, uh, what I picked up from all the, the highly interesting and very complex statements uh, is that uh, in your view, which seems to be a very uh, optimistic, positive view, uh, solidarity can indeed be created through mutual understanding, through foster, uh, fostering mutual understanding, and vehicles of that understanding, of creating that understanding, are, according to you, uh, to look at each other's narratives, uh, to, um, to look at, uh, at literature, to look at history, memory, uh, to try to understand each other's position in, uh, through oral history projects, through history teaching, and through uh, exhibitions. And this reminds me of what uh, Timothy Garten Esch once said in, a, in an event at uh, the House of European History when he said that uh, we, rather than telling always our own stories, we should start to be able uh, to listen to each other, to, to have empathy, and to start being able to tell uh, each other's stories. So, uh, in that case, he mentioned that Germans should be able to, uh, to, to tell uh, Greek stories and vice versa and not always looking at their own, at their own position. So um, this brings me to my question, um, which is uh, actually to reflect on the impact of what you're doing. I don't know uh, in how far uh, you are doing that. I mean, I'm, this is a very difficult question also for us, uh, museum makers. Uh, what is the impact of what we are doing? And um, if we, we heard this morning that the distortion of historical, uh, of history and memory is used politically and can uh, by that uh, have an impact on the course of history, can, an can have an impact on the present, uh, how in uh, uh, turning it uh, the other way around, how can your work have this impact, this, uh, this positive impact for reconciliation? And when you, you mentioned in the beginning the, the, um, the singing revolution in, uh, in the uh, Baltic countries, uh, it's, in a way it's, uh, it's a very encouraging that art can make, uh, even can make uh, um, history move. So uh, the question of the impact of what you are doing, um, can, you, can you measure it? Can you see how it works? Who is your audience? That would be my uh, follow-up question. Uh, but I, I, I would also like to open the floor now to the audience so that uh, you, you can then answer the, uh, several questions at once, because otherwise we will not uh, leave the audience enough time. So I would now like to open the floor. Uh, and uh, here's the microphone. And please uh, ask your questions. Um, I will see who is first. No question for the moment. Yes, the gentleman over there. Hello, Nelgar Sengesers, I will be the brave one. I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Erki Tuomoyo, uh, as the first uh, responder, but probably someone else also might join, uh, what I was thinking for two days sitting in this great o audience is that we are speaking about solidarity and uh, solidarity amongst historians with history, with historical ma matters, 
and mostly we are speaking about a uh, form of action, which is solidarity. But w besides this form of action, there is uh, values and there are motivations. Uh, mostly we are speaking about solidarity based on European values, democracy, uh, rule of law, etc., 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 which actually are rather new phenomena in European history. And as historians, we are very often dealing with the periods and processes outside of this framework, which makes us a trouble. Uh, what I was thinking, looking on these beautiful pictures on the wall, is that aren't we losing connection of, with history, uh, 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 to historical connection, not only with uh, um, political sustainability of democracy, which civic education is one of the bases, with uh, cultural Europeanization or, or Europeanization and sustainability of cultural dimension of our identity, or how we could avoid this split uh, to merge them together. Well, they are, these are very important and uh, complex uh, questions. First of all, uh, I think that the primary the, uh, object of solidarity for historians should be solidarity with facts and solidarity with truth even with unpalatable truths and facts. Uh, and uh, that, is, that is a uh, hard uh, criterion uh, which uh, not all historians uh, meet. Um, but then also I would like to uh, say that Historians Without Borders is not only about Europe. Uh, we are also, uh, we have had contacts with historians uh, in Africa, in Asia, in uh, North America, uh, and all over the world. And uh, one of our objects, uh, one of our aims has been uh, to find, find the conditions. Uh, we had a, actually a seminar in Johannesburg, South Africa, where we brought together historians from colonial, uh, former colonial powers and former colonies. And this is the kind of thing that we would like to also continue with because this colonial history has been mostly written by historians from either the colonial powers or the uh, former colonies with very little interaction between them. Uh, so this is the kind of grand vision we have also. So, but there are other items, and particularly when we are today concerned, why is the rest of the world not joining us in supporting Ukraine as we are doing, and not joining all the sanctions against the aggressor that which we have set? I think we also need to look at history, and how, how this history is seen from the other parts of the world, and that there may be also cases of double standards involved. So there are questions why we have not reacted in a similar manner to other occupation, other illegal occupations, and other wars, wars in the world. So I think this is a lesson that we, we need to look uh, at Europe also from the outside of non-European eyes. We don't have to compromise on our values, that's quite clear. But we have to understand also the narrative and perspective from other parts of the world. Thank you very much. Jadwig Garodowicz from Poland. I have my question to uh, Mr. Maciej Piotrowski. Um, I listened to your presentation with deep interest and I would like to ask you whether you are directing also some of your activities, especially in, uh, in literature, in translations, vis-a-vis -vis this huge, uh, you know, uh, population of Ukrainian refugees which are now in Poland. Thank you. Uh, of course, of course, now we have this uh, situation where Poland, uh, first time in uh, like uh, eight, uh, 800 years, uh, are multicultural uh, um, uh, place. Uh, uh, all my life there was uh, only Poles in Poland, almost uh, 95%. Uh, now there is huge population of Ukrainians and we have to uh, cooperate, deal uh, with, with it, uh, and I think uh, due to action of uh, all of us, all of this uh, cultural sector of uh, historian, uh, museologist, uh, we have some common grants to cooperate, and everyone 
of us make a little bit, uh, little piece to this uh, building this common platform, common grant, uh, and uh, be due to this and uh, because of that we share common values. Uh, uh, thanks to the all the uh, uh, culture creators of culture from Vasil Stus, Vasil Barka. Uh, Polish writers and translators who translate Zbigniew Herbert to Ukrainians, uh, to Ukrainian and, for example, Vasil Stus to uh, Polish. Uh, we have this common understanding, uh, which help us to uh, to talk with each other. And of course, many of uh, books, many of projects, as Holodomor Museum, we make some exhibition in Warsaw to show how we created this, uh, this uh, concept of exhibition was uh, event, all these events was uh, both um, visited by Polish and Ukrainians in Warsaw. Uh, and uh, that is thing that, that uh, it's helping us to, to meet in one place uh, due to this uh, work of all people from many generations sharing this and popularization of these uh, European values. Uh, of course, we have neighbors who do, didn't uh, want to share these values for us. Uh, also, there was translators from Russia. There were people who want to make Russia and uh, uh, Poland uh, also understand each other. They, uh, due to political uh, reasons, due to choice of Russian uh, government and Russian nation, this process with Russia was failed and Russia now we cannot have any solidarity for uh, war criminals from these, these places. And that's big problem for us. Cultural workers can do this big work, but uh, of course it, uh, it isn't enough uh, and it isn't possible uh, Every time, it's, it's not that beautiful world that we will love each other. Uh, however, uh, to answer your question and ask your question about impacts of our projects. Yes, I think it's possible to uh, work with Ukrainian migrants, like in also uh, programs from, for young people in Nizhe Foundation. We can work due to this very, very long work of, uh, of cultural workers. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm, I'm just shocked that because uh, um, yesterday I was just playing chess down there as a math student and I studied math 23 years ago, I guess, and history of science and journalism in different places. And we are finishing a book, we are four of us, and we got the grant in Montevideo in the Ministry of Science and Education. And it's a book that's it's just talking about migrations, people migrations, also birds migrations, plants migrations, but human migrations from, I guess, at least 2,000 years ago, somehow. It's a, it's a, we are four of us, and we are drawing, two to people, to people drawing, to writing in both sides of the, in the Atlantic side and this, our side. Mediterranean one. Uh, so what I'm just I'm shocked because uh, we are concerned concerned about everything is has been talked, but we were unconnected. So we are publishing in on, on, on September, about September, and I wonder if there is a way just to even to fact check checking what we wrote. For instance, because we are aware that we have responsibility, we 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 know that, and we uh, as, uh, being here, I'm even more concerned with uh, this subjective truth we are uh, collectively constructing. So I think I, I'm pleased to be here because yesterday I was just passing from one uh, yard to to the other. And uh, well, just wanted to say that y this in order to keep uh, or collect interests of cross bridging, uh, because we have also uh, talking about uh, this the narrative dimension. We have also a 
open code um, augmented reality application, which is thought and is working with uh, neighborhoods, and this is common uh, community, ho I don't know how to say it, but memory of alive uh, neighborhoods, which include people coming from, uh, we are in Barcelona, I was born here, so the diversity of people that who are arriving, just bringing stories and bringing different cultures, okay. It's a huge thing, so um, um, it's third time I say I'm, I'm sh shocked, but pleased to be here. Thank you very much. That's a very, uh, very um, pertinent question, the question of how objective can we be and the responsibility of the narrator. Does, does uh, one of the panelists want to react to this statement? Yaki. If I, if I may, um, because um, the, it actually the world has been changed in the fact that, that um, Historians have been mostly engaged in writing their own national history and from their own national perspective and from their own uh, population's perspective. But in today's world, in today's Europe, we have countries where 10 to 20 percent of the population are people who are born from in other countries and represent other cultures. So this is a challenge uh, for us as historians to be able to incorporate the different histories and backgrounds and cultures in a common history. But I think this is a positive challenge because it challenges our way, our former way of looking at it from a very narrow nationalistic point of view uh, at your own history and neglecting other points of view. So I welcome this uh, challenge, even if it is in practice a very difficult one. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Mario. I'm from Porto, Portugal. I'm from the University of Porto. And uh, I would like to thank you for your, uh, I think, uh, interesting interventions. And I would like to uh, make two questions, uh, one statement, two questions, uh, to Elki and to Finn. Okay? Um, I'm uh, uh, considering the beginnings, the transformation that occurred in, the, in Europe uh, in a, a period I call in the in-between centuries, between 19th and uh, 20th century. And uh, the, the, um, the value of the literature uh, to the spread of the history. We've got some, uh, uh, some writers like uh, uh, Stephen Zweig, uh, for instance, Joseph Roth, uh, we've got Ernest Hemingway, uh, and we've got another historian and economical uh, uh, writer that is Karl Polanyi, that uh, they write, they wrote about the history that led to the, uh, to the situation that we achieved in the, 19th, in the 1930s decade. Okay? So, uh, but they were uh, writers that were read and they, sp they were not historians, but uh, uh, they spread the message. And uh, the question is, uh, like uh, um, then, uh, uh, 100 years ago, I would say uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Zweig wrote the, their novels, his novels, uh, a novel that is called, uh, uh, a book that is called The World of Yesterday. I think it's very important to understand the passage between the 19th and the 20th century and all that happened there. The question is, uh, who do we, we have now writing about the present to reach the next generations? Uh, we got some movies. We got a movie, for instance, that, uh, I would say uh, the, 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 the title in Spanish, uh, El Olvido Que Seremos, uh, that is uh, um, um, a, a very important movie that was made, and also a Catalan movie that is called Mediterranean, uh, that, uh, that's, that told us about the reality about South America and about the refugees of the Mediterranean. But in literature, I would like to know who is writing now about what is passing now in Europe, for instance. And the next question, final question is for Finn. Uh, what are we doing in the history uh, um, teaching uh, uh, all around Europe just to tell the story of both sides? Let's say, uh, not all, uh, about a history that could uh, give the opportunity to the students 
uh, to reach the, the information to create their own opinion about what happened in the history of the late, uh, uh, last uh, hundred years, for, is, for instance, uh, just to understand what happened in, uh, in the, the view of uh, one side of the barricade and the, the, the other side of the barricade, because we know history is made by the winners of the political process of the war process. Okay, thank you very much, uh, and thank you. Well, I don't think that I'm uh, well prepared to answer the question of, of the literature, first of all, but I will uh, answer the, the second one, I guess, yeah. Well, if I understood your question right, it was about uh, whether one shall or how to teach uh, uh, history of the other side. I mean, it's generally what, what, in the, what the Council of Europe tries to do is, uh, or tries to encourage, because uh, um, is that that for example the end of World War II for example you you, you get the the, uh, the the perspective of, of, of the French of the Allied and uh, also of the occupation also the the, the perspective of the German um, of the German um, side of, 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 of on this end of the war and and the partition of the Cold War so it's it's actually contrasting as as, as you said also different national uh, narratives so you get uh, to, to get the, the, the stories and the diversity of stories actually um, in the history classroom, not only from different countries but also from different groups in society, like to, 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 to hear the, 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 actually the voices of, of persecuted of the, of the Nazi regime um, in the classrooms next to, to, the, uh, uh, to, the, to, to learning about the, the functioning of the Nazi regime, for example. But it's, it's general to diversify the, 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 the narratives that you get in the classroom and not to have a single narrative. And, there are many ways to achieve that, I believe, and uh, we also do not go and uh, tell the member states well, how, how is it best to do this, but we, we see and we observe how it is done in the classroom and uh, uh, we start a dialogue with the civil society and with the organizations in this field to, to have an exchange on uh, how to, uh, well, to, to reflect on this and if there's need and how to improve on this. Well, every historian uh, has the, uh, her or his own national and cultural biases. Some more, some less, but nobody is completely free from that. And that is why uh, it is not enough to try and write history from the other uh, point of view, but it's also important to listen to the narrative of the other side. You do not have to accept it, you can contest it, but you have to listen to it and you have to know it. That is the beginning for any kind of uh, uh, cross-border, cross-cultural historical understanding. Um, uh, but I'm more worried in general about the uh, role of history in today's world, because at least in Finland, but I, so I, what I know is that the situation is similar in many other countries, that the teaching of history has been uh, reduced in schools, uh, and it has become a voluntary subject in many, in many cases. And the less people are aware of how and where and from what we have arrived from where we are today, the less unable they are to see into the future either. And they be, are, become easily captured by myth, historical myths and those who abuse history for their own ends. So I think that we have a common interest in trying to strengthen the uh, learning an understanding of history in all spaces. I believe today it's possible to graduate from universities if you are not studying history without being able to correctly answer the question who were fighting in the First and Second World Wars against each other. <laughs> One last question. Um, it's maybe not questions, it's like reflection uh, that um, I think a lot that uh, we need these two sides, both, a lot of opinions. But um, now uh, I'm, I'm staying in Ukraine uh, last year. I'm not Ukrainian refugees, but I'm traveling a lot uh, in Europe. And when I come to European Historical Museum, also like museum in Berlin, Museum of Capitulation, I see only these two bots, yes, two sides. And these two sides, it's uh, German Nazi, and this is Russia, like victory. And I not see in this museum history uh, of Ukrainian experience of Second World and other country. And 
I think this uh, algorithm of two sides, of both sides, not work now. And, um, and I'm also thinking about this good Russia, uh, where, where this good Russia and good Russia historical, and where the result of uh, work of this good Russia historical for also for Ukraine, for Syria, and for other countries which was under attack last year. And I also understand that it's not work. And uh, for me, is the questions, what work? For teaching, for museum workers, and for people who are inside of war. Because for me, like young generator, it's concept destroying when war come to Ukraine. And um, is the questions for all, we are all professional, we all work with memory, and I think now is the end of this conception. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with this last statement, perhaps I would like to give the two ladies uh, the, the opportunity to, to speak a second time also. And, and also the, uh, the last question still resonates in my, in my mind, the question of who is writing the literature that uh, our children will read about today's situation. And I think some examples were mentioned um, in the Ukrainian uh, first example. So I, 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 who wants to go first, Luisa? And then yes, I would like to, to answer about, uh, to the question about the impact. Eh, lo voy a hacer en castellano. Eh, el impacto Spanish. Eh, el impacto the, que impact, estamos, uh, the impact we're searching with these two projects, Migrate and Membrane Child, is knowledge in order to approach humanitarian practice to a wider audience to disseminate this humanitarian aid in its most noble and pure version, the way it was practiced at different times in our recent history. And I'm thinking about during First World War, Spanish Civil War and Second World War, practiced by volunteers and women men and women from solidarity, kindness, based on their beliefs, religious beliefs, and pacifist beliefs. Therefore, the impact we're searching is to communicate the idea of humanitarian aid and humanitarianism based on the principle of helping people to alleviate their suffering and to provide the most dignified human conditions or maybe to preserve his or her life and uh, especially in the case of children, to help and alleviate victims of war through examples, facts, and veracities. Truth. Um, sorry, you. I had another um, another answer because during the the last intervention, uh, someone was talking about God Russia. Um, Efectivamente, tenemos distintas. We do have. Yes, we do have different visions based on the past, what we've lived in Eastern Europe and the experiences we have had in the rest of Europe. For many children of the war, victims of the Spanish Civil War that were evacuated to the Soviet Union between 1937 and 1938, the Soviet Union was their second homeland. The Soviet Union was good for them, a country that welcomed them, took care of them, educate them far away from their home country and their families. Thank you, Luisa. Uh, I will probably just explain what it's all how not only Russia, Soviet Union is only very NATO by Soviet Union. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, okay. that's why uh, I wanted to explain also. I would like to give the yeah. last word of the panelists to uh, okay. Dana. You had the first and the last. Yeah, uh, a lot of thoughts, I should say, while listening to all what, is, what was said. 
Uh, first of all, when we are talking about literature, to read about what is happening now uh, in Europe, uh, we need to translate more. And not from the um, larger languages like uh, uh, English, Spanish, or Russian, but from the small languages. From the small uh, countries that are, uh, that are in the situations that we don't know the real story from the inside. And I'm not speaking about Ukrainians now. I'm speaking about the singing revolution in Lithuania. We don't know what was, like, how was it to be there at that time, what they felt. I only knew that after I went to Lithuania to my friends and they told me their story while we were doing the project with the translation and with the young writers. The second thing is we shouldn't do the work to bring the terminology about this time that is happening now and using it already. That I mean about the Putin's Russian. Sorry, but it's, uh, it's not the term uh, or the word or the part of word that we can use to be connected to the history that is happening now. If we are need to be objective, as I understand from the mission of the historians through the borders, we should wait before we do determine for what is happening, the word of what is happening now, and how we define the country which is doing the uh, things that they are doing now. It's not only Putin. It's very important for Georgian people, it's very important for Ukrainian people that all the, um, so all the history that is told about what is happening now in our country is not used with an explanation about only one person who is responsible. It's it's thing that I cannot like understand and will not agree from my perspective. About the impact, as I was saying, the, we are now focused of working with the translation, of working with knowing more about the countries that, are, uh, that weren't in our focus before that. Because we need to acknowledge that Ukraine, uh, Georgia, Lithuania, Estonia, Finland were under influence of the Russian country for a long time and we didn't communicate with each other as we should be. Just this little border and also Belarus, little border between the Europe and the Russia. And we don't know the history, the history of the countries that are at the same line. And this was the big, um, how to say it, surprise for me that we are not communicating and we are not translating from the languages. This is our focus of our office now and the impact that I got from the project that we did the last year. That we need to work more with the people who are on the same border uh, with the aggression that is happening in our, uh, in our country now. Uh, also, as I understood, when we are speaking together and we are looking for the smaller speaker, not for the bigger one, like in the meaning of the country, in the meaning of the culture, we can hear a very surprising point of view to the history. That was all I was talking about when she was talking about the perspective of the Second World War, because in Ukraine it's also the same. We didn't took part, we didn't fight, fight in Second World if you are listening to the Russian histori historical books. There was only Russian heroics at the front line. There was only Russians in the front and they were saving all the people in the world from what was happening. But it isn't true. There is a beautiful book of Ukrainian uh, cinema um, director, Oleksandr Dovzhenko, who fought in the war, during the war, and he wrote it. It's like a, um, how it is, notebook, yes, of his, uh, uh, all, all the stories from the war. And it was uh, cut and published with, uh, um, without some pieces in the, in the Soviet times, and only, I think, two or three years ago, we got the whole book published. And this is the story that um, amazed me. He was explaining how, how, how awful it was for Ukraine, the Second World War for our territory. We are not speaking about this even now. 
because when we are speaking in Europe about the Second World War, as all has said, it's a perspective of the winner and the bigger one. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, we were asked this morning what we can be proud of. Uh, perhaps it's, it's too strong a word, but what you are all doing especially gives me a, a sense of hope, uh, a, a sense of uh, that reconciliation and solidarity is there and that it, uh, it, it can be created. Now we heard um, something that um, we also say at the end of our exhibition in the, in the House of European History, that it is that because of the diversity of who we are in Europe and because of the diversity of our histories and the diversity of our memories that we have heard about, um, and the diversity of our narratives, uh, be they uh, uh, made by big or small actors, we need translations. And, and Umberto Eco said, translations are the language of Europe. So you all showed that this is uh, possible and necessary. And, uh, and I would add to that that uh, f those, what we translate, what, do, what does it need? It needs listening. It needs uh, listeners. It needs readers. It needs uh, the receiving end as well. And uh, that is what I hope for, um, and that is what we will also continue now to do during, during our two days here in Barcelona. So I would like to thank you all for uh, your listening and speaking exercise and for your patience. And now I won't stand in the, in the way of your lunch anymore. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>